Welcome to Cornerstone Church Colchester. For those who don't know me, my name is Tom. And as most of you will probably be aware by now, we have been meeting on a Sunday in person and it has been an absolute joy. And this video is a bit like the best of from Cornerstone Colchester, taken from our Sunday service. And it is ideal for those that were unable to make the full service on Sunday, or possibly those that were there, but just want to hear it all again. Well, on Sunday, we started our new series in Mark's Gospel, and our pastor, John Parker, will be bringing us more from the Gospel of Mark all the way up into Christmas. Please do have a look out for the info at the end of the video, which shows all of our plans for this coming autumn term at Cornerstone. Alternatively, visit our website or Facebook page where you can also find the info. So let's start by having our reading, followed by John's sermon, film live on Sunday. And remember, for the full experience, please do join us on a Sunday morning. We would love to see you. Today's reading is taken from Mark chapter 1. Verses 1 to 26. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the one who rules all creation, the Son of God. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand who you are and that our knowledge of you is such good news for us and for the whole world. Lord, we're conscious that we need your Spirit's help, so please help me as I speak to trust in him and please help us all as we listen to trust in your spirit's power to give us light and life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, are we in a spiritual wilderness? Maybe we feel disconnected from God or he seems distant. Maybe we're still sort of recovering from lockdown feelings. Maybe the Lord Jesus feels less important in our eyes than he used to. Or, or maybe we're conscious that at a heart level we've lost some feelings for Jesus. Our love may have grown weak or cold. Maybe we feel we're just going through the motions of, of church, of discipleship. Or maybe we sense that we're just coming out of a spiritual wilderness. We're thinking, what was that about? Or maybe we're very conscious that we are in the wilderness and we're thinking, well, how can I get out? Wilderness for Israel had lots and lots of connotations. We probably miss the significance of the word wilderness as it was read. It's everywhere once you see it. 
I guess it's the kind of word that was in the national psyche of Israel at that time, like, for example, the Somme. It's just a river in France, but what other connotations does it have? Connotations of slaughter, of millions of deaths, or the Twin Towers. In one sense, it's just a place in New York, or was. But now, if you mention that word, it's got lots of connotations. And it was similar for Israel with the word wilderness. See, that's where they'd wandered for 40 years when they had been rescued out of Egypt because of their disobedience and rebellion against God, because of their idolatry. A whole generation, even Moses, had died in the wilderness, the other side of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River was the barrier that separated them from the Promised Land. It took a Joshua, a Jesus, to bring them into the Promised Land. And yet, once they had got into the Promised Land, their disobedience, their repeated idolatry had meant that invaders from the wilderness, from the east, from Babylon, Assyria, had dragged them back that way. So 580 years before Jesus was born, they'd found themselves defeated in exile. Jerusalem had been destroyed. So that's some of the context. And we're beginning a new series um, today, as I, as I mentioned, uh, where we're looking at, at Mark's Gospel and, and thinking about how we grow as a Gospel community. Many of us may know Mark's Gospel fairly well. Well, I think there's still lots to learn from Mark's Gospel about how we can be a Gospel community, how in our discipleship we can grow. Uh, and my hope is that as we get to know Mark's Gospel, we might even think about reading it with somebody else who, who's yet to know the Lord Jesus. And to that end, I'm just going to give a very quick structure of Mark's Gospel so that we've got sort of mental filing cabinet to hang things in. Chapters 1 to 8 are really, as anyone who's done Christianity Explored will know, I think it's a very helpful and simple way of summarising Mark's Gospel. Chapters 1 to 8 answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Chapters 1 to 8, half the Gospel. 16 chapters. Next half, chapters 8 to 16, why did he come? What was his mission? And the whole of Mark's gospel is really about what does it mean to follow him from beginning to end. That's Mark's interest. And he's writing the Apostle Peter's eyewitness account. He's summarising Peter's preaching, probably in Rome, about writing about AD 65. So there's a bit more background. But what is God saying to us this morning in these first 13 verses? Well, you'll see the points on your sheets. The gospel is the person who can save us from the wilderness of sin. The gospel is the person. The gospel is about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not a, a, a system of theology. It's not an intellectual doctrinal list that we can tick off. It's about a person. And he can save us from the wilderness of sin. Let's look at verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, Peter wasn't subtle in his preaching, was he? Straight in there, Jesus is the King, the Christ. He's the Son of God, not the Roman Emperor, who got you in a bit of trouble in the first century. Jesus is the Son of God. See, the, the, the word good news in the ancient world was for the victory of an emperor or a king who would be returning with glory and gifts and the people had to get ready for his return because he'd be giving out gifts. And Mark tells us that this is good news concerning Jesus Christ. Jesus the anointed one. I'm sure we all know that. He is the anointed one. God's anointed, the king the Son of God, promised long ago for hundreds of years. And, and the Son who has the same nature as God, Yahweh. Look, look at verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for, or of the Lord. That's capital L-O-R-D. Yahweh, the, the covenant Lord, the I am, that I am, the self-existent one, the eternal one, the one who is the most high God, the Lord of hosts, the 
the one who knows the end from the beginning, the Lord, Yahweh, is coming from the wilderness. And so, verse 4, John appeared, baptising in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This is really significant. See, the whole nation of the Jews were leaving Jerusalem, were, were leaving the city of God, the capital, the, the place where they were told they could confess their sins, which is the temple where all the sacrifices of animals were still taking place. They were leaving that and they were going back to the wilderness because John was preaching, God is coming. And they were confessing their sins. John was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness. People had to turn away from their sins. They were in effect saying, because they believed the prophecy of Haggai that we were looking at and the prophecy of Zechariah that we were looking at they, they really believed that the temple was not going to deal with their sin it wasn't good enough to be an Israelite it, it wasn't good enough to be circumcised it wasn't good enough to try and keep the Ten Commandments they needed a deeper dealing with sin and so when they heard that John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight out they flocked into the wilderness into the place which symbolized their rebellion and their idolatry their sin and their disobedience because now the Son of God was coming see the gospel is the person who can save us out of the wilderness of sin and uh, our first point really is well, who is this person well we know it's Jesus Christ the Son of God but he's also our representative he stands in our place see at Jesus baptism God says from heaven verse 11 have a look with me you are my beloved son with you I'm well pleased here is the beloved son of the father the second person of the Trinity he's the one on whom the spirit descends and rests you might say but how is he our representative how is he standing in our place I know that he stands in my place when he dies on the cross, but here it's rich in saying that Christ is our representative. See, why does the father say of his son, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased, at this point? Well, at his baptism, was Jesus repenting of anything? Was he confessing his sins? Of course not. He was standing in our place. He was standing in the place of his people Israel. He was their representative. Caught, perished the thought that Jesus had sin to confess, that he had anything to repent of. No, he was standing in the place of his people. Here is the beloved, perfect Son of God, who in eternity past created all things, who sustains all things, by his powerful word, who had taken into himself a human nature, becoming fully human and remaining fully God, who was tempted as we are yet without sin, and yet he is baptized. The sign of repentance, the sign of confession of sin. He begins where we begin. He begins in the wilderness, the place of sin, rebellion, death, he stands in our place and he goes to the place where he's tempted by the devil. Do you see that in verse 12? In the spirit, immediately drove him out where? Into the wilderness. It would have made sense for the original hearers, many of whom would be Jews in Rome, that the Christ was sent out into the wilderness for 40 days, like the 40 years, to be tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals. The angels were ministering to him. He was he was doing what Israel could never do. He passed the test in the wilderness. Now, obviously we know, and Mark will continue to remind us that Jesus is our representative when he dies in agony on the cross, taking the punishment we deserve. But here he identifies with us 
Jesus identifies with us sinful human beings. He represents us before God. And so he starts in the wilderness. So I don't know what wilderness we feel that we're going through, probably exacerbated by lockdown, insecurity, unanswered prayer. Jesus is there. He's gone before. I don't know what we're experiencing in life. What has led to our own wilderness of sin? It might be an idolatry of our heart that we are battling with. Or suffering the consequences of our sin or other people's sin. Jesus knows the wilderness. He's been there. He's able to save us from there. You see, this is not the place of, of, of never hearing about God. It's not the place of somebody who's never heard. This is the place of God's disobedient people. The nation of Israel. Those who sought to go, keep God's commandments but couldn't. And isn't it great, isn't it great that Jesus meets us in that place, in the wilderness. The wilderness of sin and idolatry, of disobedience to God. Even those who are religious, even those who name the name of Jesus Christ can pass through a wilderness. And as a gospel community, because Jesus starts with people who are in the wilderness, we are too as well. You see, people may come to us, mightn't they? Battered, bruised, in slavery to sin, bound by idolatry, under the power of Satan, and that's where Jesus starts. We're not to be a community where we think we've all got our lives together. Because Jesus comes for people who, are, who know that they're still in the wilderness of sin. <laughs> they need more than their own efforts to obey God. They need God to come and cleanse them from sin. And they need God to come and dwell in them and give them life by his Holy Spirit. Those who need to repent for forgiveness. And that's our second point. How, how does Jesus save people like you and me? How does he save anybody from the wilderness? And that's an ongoing through life kind of thing isn't it it's not that when we first come to know Christ that's it we never go back to the wilderness we never we, we never are idolatrous again or we never sin again of course not and this is what John the Baptist was preaching wasn't it through our repentance for forgiveness so everybody was going out to John verse 4 appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and all the the country of Judea and all Jerusalem apart from the religious leaders of course they thought they didn't need to go out to see John but were going out to him, the River Jordan, confessing their sins. They knew they needed to start all over again. Now, in case we misunderstand this, it's important to, to talk about repentance. There is a decisive returning to God, isn't there? We don't need to become Christians all over again if we become Christians. But what John the Baptist is saying is it's not enough to be religious. It wasn't enough to be Jews. It wasn't enough to go to the temple and offer sacrifices. It wasn't enough to seek to keep the Ten Commandments. No, they needed a decisive repentance. They needed to come to Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And, and I guess most of us have done that. But as we begin, so we continue. It's like that feeling, I was trying to think what the feeling is like of knowing that we need to repent. You know when you're sort of working on a document, um, uh, you, you think you're getting on really well and, and it's near to the end of completion and, and it's all just ready, ready to be submitted. And then the computer crashes and for some reason autosave doesn't work. I don't know why that is, it has happened to me a number of times probably because of my incompetence and we've got to start all over again oh oh so so discouraging or well, snakes and ladders this is the only other illustration I could think of you know there's that snake on snakes of ladders when you're you're near the end and, and you you get on and it takes you all the way back to the beginning Or, or more seriously, someone has had a stroke and they need to learn to walk and talk all over again. We need to be happy to keep going back to the beginning, 
to confess our sins. We're the kind of people who start in the wilderness. And so when people join us and they're clearly in the wilderness, it's not like we're further on. We keep going back to the same place, the same place of idolatry and rebellion. And yes, we're in Christ and we've got a certain future, but we never move on from repentance and confession of sin, do we? It's like Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That's a daily confession. It's why as a community, we are happy Sunday by Sunday, to pray the confession, to repent of our sins, because we need to keep starting there. Yes, we're in Christ. Yes, we're going to glory. He has hold of us. He will never let go of us. But this is where Jesus starts, with everybody. So just a few questions. When was the last time you repented before God in private? When you confessed your sins to him? And then finally, we, we repent of our sins, we confess our sins, but also, how does Jesus save people like you and me? Well, by, by baptism in the Holy Spirit, verse 6. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt round his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. The desert, wilderness kind of diet, like Elijah before him. But what does John preach apart from repentance? Well, verse 7 is what he also preached. He preached saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. God's King, God's Son, is the only person who can baptise people with the Holy Spirit, is he not? John, who Jesus said was the greatest prophet, yes, greater than Moses and Elijah, the greatest prophet says of this one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit, I'm not worthy even to wipe the filth of Jesus' sandals. I'm not worthy. This king is so high, so exalted. It is more than calling people to repentance and confession of sin. He's God's king, the son of God, the one who will pour out the Holy Spirit as he is raised from the dead and exalted to the highest place in heaven and on earth and so will pour out the Holy Spirit onto his church and baptize all those disciples on the day of Pentecost in the Holy Spirit bringing new life peace between God and humanity he is the only one who can bring life out of the wilderness um, I just want to read Isaiah uh, 35 uh, at the risk of um, perhaps reading too much, but uh, turn with me to Isaiah 35 and you'll see how this speaks of this salvation of God. God is going to come and life is going to come in the desert. And you'll see how it speaks of Jesus. So Isaiah, which which Mark has already um, mentioned at the beginning of the passage, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. Sorry, does anybody want to shout out a page number if we haven't got... Great. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then they shall, the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and that shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk it on the way, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. See, when God comes, he brings life. The desert blooms. 
and he leads those who are forgiven and cleansed and ransomed into everlasting joy. And that is the work of the Spirit that the Christ baptizes his people with. But as we close, I just want to, to think a little bit more about how we apply this and apply this to our community. I'm sure we know that all Christians have been baptized in the Holy Spirit because it's only Jesus Christ who can baptize people in the Spirit. But then as we go on, we need to constantly be filled with the Spirit, don't we? So let's just turn to Ephesians 5 as we finish. Somebody wants to shout out a page number. Uh, and as I read this, I, ju I just want you to see how it's easy to miss that this is all about Jesus Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is all about Jesus Christ. It's not to say there aren't means by which he fills us. Verse 17 of chapter 5. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. It's about our understanding being filled with the Spirit. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, it's not depressing our minds like alcohol does in drunkenness. It's having our understanding strengthened in a whole person kind of way. So how are we to do that? These are all participles that flow from the command to be filled with the Spirit, each and every one of us. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord, with all your heart, we want to sing to one another and we want to sing to the Lord. Christ is our focus. He's the one who baptizes and fills with the Spirit because he is king. Verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grumbling in the desert. No, thankfulness under the king <coughs> verse 21 submitting to one another out of reverence for christ as as we gather we are to submit to one another as we sing who are we to be conscious of christ so yes we've been baptized in the spirit we are to continue to be filled with the spirit we want to be relaxed and informal don't we but our relationships the way we sing the way we relate to one another this morning we are to be conscious of the king. We're not worthy even to wipe the filth off his feet. He must become greater and we must become less. And yet how he loves us, how he has given us life in the Holy Spirit that takes us out of the wilderness of sin and idolatry and the wrath of God as we repent, as we're filled with the Spirit, as we begin. So we go on. So are you in the wilderness? You know the person to go to. There's only one person who can save us from the wilderness of sin and idolatry. We need to repent, confess our sins to him and be refreshed by his life-giving Holy Spirit, either for the first time or again and again and again and again. So we cross the river of Jordan into the promised land. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts, you know what different aspects of our sin and idolatry we are struggling with and we come back to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We repent and we pray that you would fill us afresh, Lord Jesus Christ, by your Holy Spirit, giving us that life, that joy, knowing that we're on to, going on to everlasting glory. Please be with us now as we come to confess our sins. Work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna confess our sins now um, in the words of the confession. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and confess our many sins, which we have committed by thought, word and deed, against your divine majesty, provoking your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our misdoings. The memory of them grieves us. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive all that is past, and grant that from now on we may always serve and please you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit, to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These are familiar words, but I think they're so important. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Let's pray the collect together. Almighty and eternal God, grant that we may grow in faith, hope and love, and so that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs>